Uh, hey, everybody, and welcome back to another fantastic episode of Turbonomics' number one active podcast on YouTube. It's a lot of qualifiers there. The Greg and Joe <laughs> Turbo Show. Uh, as always, uh, I'm your host, Joe, joined by my co-host, the great and powerful, the man who's who's so great, in fact, he has two Gs at the end of his name, uh, Mr. Greg Minicello. Hey, Greg. Hey, how are you? Doing good, doing good. Um, really excited for today. Uh, this is one that uh, we've been planning for a while, and with all the stuff going on in Turbo today, it's super great timing to ha have him on. Uh, so welcome, Joe Benincasa, uh, Software Development Manager for all things PaaS optimization and Turbo. Hey, Joe. Two Joes. Hey. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's uh, it's good to be on. Absolutely. Um, well, we're happy to have you. Uh, maybe we can just start with, for the folks at home, uh, who aren't in the know, maybe give us a little info on uh, on who you are, what you do, and, and sort of how you got here. Sure, yeah. So, um, you know, I uh, <laughs> so I'll start, I'll go way back um, because my journey to kind of joining Turbo goes way back. Um, you know, I, I actually did undergraduate degrees in brain and cognitive science and economics. Um, you know, I'd been kind of programming as a teenager, but uh, wasn't... <laughs> wasn't planning on going into software engineering or development as my career. Um, so I, I was working for a uh, scientific laboratory, uh, working toward getting into a PhD program uh, when, you know, my lab managers realized that I could write code. Um, and so, you know, went from doing data analysis to uh, creating experiments for our lab, um, writing software to interface with an eye tracker, and, uh, you know, kind of realized after spending all day every day doing engineering that uh, I was really actually more passionate about building things than I was about doing basic research. So I, uh, I declined a PhD opportunity to go into software and um, here we are. So I, I worked in security and kind of endpoint management, uh, creating automated threat detection tools. Um, then I worked in automated video auditing. And, um, and, you know, at some point along the way, a friend of mine had just joined Turbonomic and said, let me tell you about this company I just joined. You know, we're, we're, building, uh, we're building resource management tools in public cloud uh, by applying economic principles to solve these resourcing problems. And I just said, you know, that's really incredible because, you know, I had been building apps in the public cloud since 2013, um, you know, working in, auto, you know, kind of automation in general, but artificial intelligence. Um, and, you know, I had this interest in economics. That's where I kind of earned my degree. So um, I just thought this, this kind of brought all of my interests into focus for me and uh, applied and, you know, started working on the team. So I, uh, I worked as a software engineer for several years, building out our public cloud optimization capabilities, um, a lot of the kind of base level of, uh, I guess, in, you know, just all of the base implementation that went into public cloud management uh, and eventually started working on the PaaS optimization team. And, um, you know, that led me to where I am now managing the, we're calling it the cloud integrations team now. So uh, we're covering platform as a service optimization, but also handling uh, integrations with other cloud optimization tools and FinOps tools. Um, most notably, right now, we're working on integrating Aptio with Turbonomic. So uh, that's a little bit about me and, you know, how I got here. You know, What's we all it like being so smart? Sorry, I have to throw that out there because that's impressive. That is like, man, that is super cool. I had no, to be honest, I had no idea that. Yeah, this is all this is all news. Good news. <laughs> that, is, that is super, super. Turn down a PhD. That's pretty it incredible. It could have been. Oh. Dr. Joe and Joe. Well, you know, it, it. I guess I'm not the doctor in that scenario, right? I'm no, not, no, no, no. You, you got it right. It was the other Joe. <laughs> Dr. Joe. Well, well, thank you. That's very flattering. But it's actually funny because when I joined the Turbonomic team, um, you know, I, I think it was like a third of the staff on engineering had PhDs or something. So the question was actually, why don't you have your PhD? <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Fair. But well, we're, yeah, no, we're a much easier crowd here. How about that? We're, I'm impressed. I'll tell you what. Um, oh, thank you very <laughs> much. Yeah. No, it's uh, it. You know, I think it it went from 
uh, perspective of, you know, doing something that I thought was really interesting and that I was passionate about uh, and just kind of realizing if I went into academia, uh, probably wouldn't have as much control over my career. My career would kind of have control over me. So decided to, uh, you know, pivot into software where I could um, enjoy myself every day and also have kind of the freedom and flexibility to do things that I was really interested in and live where I wanted to live. <laughs> do, do you still, just curious, because I love to play video games, and when you said eye tracker, I immediately thought of, like, uh, cool cool ways to to improve the video gaming experience. Do you still, like, build, like, uh, applications for fun for yourself, or is that you so busy with, with the work stuff that all your efforts pretty much... Pretty much yeah. out, outside of work hours, of course, IBM, he's not doing this. Yeah. For work hours. I'd, I'd love to say that I, you know, that I have a bunch of different software projects on the side, but honestly, most of, uh, most of my time I, I end up spending, you know, just working on Turbonomic. So, um, you know, for better, or for worse, that's, that's where most of my time goes. And when I'm not staring at a computer screen, I like to kind of get outside and away from technology. I spend a lot of time, you know, hiking and, you know, just kind of hanging out with friends, doing outdoor stuff. So, yeah. In the world I, with your I, eyes instead of a screen, huh? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So. Where and, are you based out of, Joe? Are you, are you um, somewhere warm? No, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm in <laughs> Westchester, I'm in Westchester County, uh, just north of New York City in, in New York. Um, you know, this was where our original engineering headquarters was, uh, right near White Plains, New York. All right. Yeah. So, so I guess talk to us then about this this idea of of paths optimization. And and again, uh, well, before you get into that, just can can you for the layman in the in the crowd, can you explain to me uh, what PaaS services are? Like, what what's first of all, what does PaaS stand for? Let, let's let's really get a baseline here. Yeah, sure. So you know, so PaaS stands for Platform as a Service. Um, the idea. The idea with PaaS is that, you know, in traditional IaaS or infrastructure as a service, where we're just talking about, you know, cloud uh, and in the context of public cloud, right? Uh, we're talking about virtual machines, storage, and network, right? Uh, kind of the primitive, uh, you know, resources of infrastructure. Um, when we talk about platform as a service, we're talking about all of those things, but also, um, you know, software, uh, operating systems, databases, uh, database management systems that go on top of those primitive pieces of infrastructure that allow customers and users to manage those, uh, those entities as a single entity, as opposed to a group of disparate ones working together. Um, you know, so, so, you know, PaaS has the benefits of allowing you to manage applications without the cost, complexity, and inflexibility of kind of on-premises build and maintenance, or even cloud build and maintenance when it comes to using more primitive infrastructure. Um, you know, providers who, who offer PaaS services host everything at their data centers, so servers, network, storage, uh, but also, like I said, operating systems, software, databases, and development tools that allow teams to build, uh, you know, more rapidly and with more agility without having to spend their time and effort, cognitive bandwidth managing, uh, you know, all of the interactions between the primitive pieces of infrastructure that underlie those systems uh, that they're developing services on. So, um, so just in terms of like, you know, a few benefits of, of platform as a service offerings, you know, to developers, um, they can build, test, deploy, update, and scale um, applications more quickly and inexpensively than they could if they had to manage their own uh, builds and uh, manage their own platforms. And in terms of the business benefits, you know, we're talking about faster time to market, a wider variety of resources on demand, uh, cost-effective scalability, you know, you're providing access to a ton of different tools from any location with the internet, just as with any, you know, cloud computing resource. Um, but then lower costs in terms of equipment licensing oftentimes is cheaper with PaaS um, and administration. So 
with platform as a service offerings, unlike primitive IaaS offerings, you get uh, patching, updating, and other administrative tasks for free, you know, done by your cloud service provider. So um, a lot less to manage, uh, much more time spent actually building applications and you know, supporting them than actually managing the infrastructure that underlies them. So, and the, uh, the traditional example that I, I always hear, you're probably going to know this one, is the, the pizza as a service, right? Where all the way on the left-hand side of the diagram, it's you own everything, the oven, the dining table, the soda, toppings, cheese, um, the, the whole gamut. You have to run the whole thing from top to bottom. You've got nobody doing anything for you, and it's, it's all managed by you. Then you get the infrastructure, you know, the, the PaaS, where maybe the dining table and the soda are where you are, and then the vendor or the restaurant manages the, the oven, the fire, the pizza dough, all that stuff. So, you know, it, it, I'm likening all these different primitives that you were talking about to the individual pieces of owning a pizza shop or running a pizza shop uh, versus just showing up to a pizza shop and getting a pizza. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, with, with PaaS, you, you have the opportunity to uh, do a lot more with you know, with a lot less, right? That when when you need to, for instance, right? If you're if you're thinking about like, let's take a concrete example. Um, you know, there's a service in Azure called App Service, and with App Service, you uh, you manage what what are called App Service plans, and this is basically a basket of resources. You get you know memory, CPU, and storage in you know baskets of various sizes and characteristics, and uh, and Within that app service plan, you can deploy um, as many applications as you'd like, and those applications share the resources in that basket. Um, all of the infrastructure management is totally abstracted away from you. Now, <laughs> when you go to scale an app service plan, they they make clear to you that you know there are virtual machines running under this thing, and so you know if you if you want to scale your app service plan you can scale it up or down by using different instance types right with those different amounts of cpu memory and and storage but you can also horizontally scale it right so you can you know just with a slider in the ui um, increase or decrease the number of vms that are underlying uh, your application so it allows you to kind of very seamlessly scale horizontally or vertically um, without ever having to worry about, you know, the actual infrastructure itself. You're just playing with a slider in the UI. So I guess a couple of questions. One, thank you, Greg. I'm hungry now. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to actually order a pizza. Yeah, yeah, yeah I got That's you. my plan. That's my plan. Yeah. Uh, but so, I mean, that all sounds great. And I know you, you've kind of said it a couple of times that this idea that it's potentially more cost effective to leverage PaaS services. So I guess... Instead of asking, I know we asked like, why would you use PaaS services? I guess maybe the, the reverse question is equally as important. So then why, why would people or organizations still leverage IaaS then if PaaS offers all these great benefits and potentially, like you said, more cost effective, less to, less to deal with? Um, yeah. are, there, are there certain times when one is appropriate and then potentially the other, you know, IaaS is better than PaaS for certain things or? Yeah, good question. Um, so I I should include a big invisible asterisk next up. Uh, more We're in post production. Don't worry. I'll just okay, we'll get it in there. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. So you know, some of the some of the challenges to managing PaaS, right? Um, these things, while they can be more cost effective than running, you know, the same applications on prem, they are expensive, right? Um, compared to if you were, let's say, you know, you're running the same database server using pure IaaS, um, you could end up spending more money, you know, in just in terms of your cloud bill on uh, on your, you know, PaaS database, right? Now, some of the some of the cost savings that we talked about come in the form um, that's not realizable on your cloud bill, right? Um, in terms of faster development, um, less time and effort spent managing infrastructure. Etc. Right, you don't see those credits on your cloud bill, <laughs> um, but you know, but these instances are more expensive than traditional infrastructure instances um, because they're bundling functionality together, right? And they're you know managing a lot more for you. Um, you know, they make experimentation easy, right? You can spin up various different databases. For instance, let's say 
I want to experiment building a MongoDB system, right? I can spin up a MongoDB database in, um, you know, just, I guess we're talking about Azure uh, in Cosmos DB, for instance, and that Mongo instance, I, let's say I experiment with it and I play with it and I decide, you know what, actually, I'm not going to use Mongo. I can just turn that thing off. Um, I didn't need to, you know, buy infrastructure, you know, buy the database server, deploy it, et cetera. I can just um, go up and down. But because they make experimentation easy, these instances are often spun up and, and just forgotten about by developers, right? They're not the ones doing the cloud administration. So they figure, ah, like someone will take care of it. And, you know, of course. Someone will take care of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. My, have to do my mom's going to do the laundry and fold it and put it away. That's fine. Yeah, I don't have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. She's got it. She's got it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and you know, in the same vein, right, these things are disparately managed a lot of the time. Um, you know, it's, from what I've seen, pretty rare that um, a central authority is is spinning up each instance every time an app team needs it, right? Like, they have federated authorities, so... Um, an application team in one business unit might, you know, spin up uh, an instance that costs $500 a day and, you know, they're managing it however they decide to, right, uh, using one set of configurations. Uh, another business unit might spin up a separate instance at, using the same service that costs $750 a day. And they have it deployed using a different model. Um, maybe they're using... Uh, you know, a different licensing model, different configuration options, et cetera. Um, and, you know, and so there's no kind of central set of rules governing how these things should actually be managed, uh, when they should be shut down or turned on, turned off, right? Um, and uh, and so that, that disparate management, I think, that is kind of a central theme for all things cloud, right? There's there's disparately managed systems, uh, but especially with PaaS, these things are really complex um, and often more complex than traditional infrastructure as a service. So, you know, like I kind of mentioned, there are different licensing models available, um, deployment models, configuration options, auto scaling options, um, replicas available, you know, whether they're, um, multi-AZ deployments or whether they're uh, multiple read-write regional uh, uh, replicas in certain databases of service offerings. Um, and, you know, and so you can, <laughs> you can often be unsure of what's really need, of what's really needed, right? When should this thing be, um, when should it be running? When should it be scaled up? When should it be scaled down? Uh, what's the application that this thing is actually supporting? So, Anyways, which, which, some which probably leads to the same thing that we see across platforms regardless is I'm, I'm not really sure. So better to have too much of it because that's better than having too little of it. Yeah. And then obviously that leads to like you kind of alluded to, like these things can get very pricey. Um, and so, you know, how, how do you how do we manage that? Right. How do we make sure we have only what we need? Because ultimately, right, that's the promise of the cloud. That's use for what you need. Not no more, no less. And yeah. it seems like it's such a simple concept, and yet the, it's a it's a struggle for everybody. Because yeah, I'll give you an example. I it, just I think the very first thing you have to understand is what's out there, right? What what is in my environment? What is running? What's costing me dollars today? Because uh, without that, you know, it's just a guess. And you come to the end of the month, you go, oh boy. <laughs> uh, you know, and I'll give you a concrete couple of concrete examples. One for the uh, the downfalls or the reason why not to use a pass service. Um, I just very easy example, uh, you know, SQL Server Enterprise Edition has features that aren't available in Azure, Azure, uh, Azure SQL, right? So, you know, if you're using a SQL Server Enterprise Server and something like, you know, you need trustworthy equals on, right? In, in the back end of your database, you can't do that with that with the PaaS, PaaS model. So you got to keep moving forward with that tech debt in enterprise, right? Um, and then uh, the other example that I'll give you about that vis visibility, I had, a, I had a person on my uh, database team spin up on a, a Hadoop cluster once um and he accidentally left it on over the weekend <laughs> yeah 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 it, it, it was bad uh, i i had to uh I, I had to eat some crow with, with my with my director <laughs> yeah yeah and you know i mean to your point right it's it's easy to make mistakes in terms of managing cloud resources mm -hmm. in general um 
but with Pez, these can be like extremely costly mistakes. Um, there are, you know, we we manage a service called Azure Synapse Analytics, right? And this is basically a cloud data warehouse, uh, data warehousing system, analytics system. Um, you know, there are these entities called dedicated SQL pools, and uh, if if you you know if you provision one of these things, they they start. You know, they start out being somewhat expensive, um, pretty expensive, I would say, um, but they go all the way up to, I believe, $252,000 a month uh, for a single instance. So, you know, you leave this thing on even for a few hours when you're not using it, and it's costing you thousands of dollars. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, when when it comes to, you know, cloud management in general, right, we're all trying to do uh, you know, to run our applications using, you know, as little money as we need to. But when it comes to, uh, when it comes to PaaS, you're really kind of playing with a chainsaw, right? You need to be sure that you need the resources that you're provisioning. Right. No scalpel here. <laughs> so how do you guys, so I know we, you've kind of talked a little bit, not maybe not directly about exactly what Turbo does, but like which PaaS services we, we optimize, but maybe before we even get to that, because there are like so many things out there. How, how do you guys go about deciding, I guess, what to what to kind of work on? Like like what path service to to bring into into Turbo? Like in yeah. organization. How how does that work for you guys? Yeah. So I mean, I think I think the process is relatively straightforward. Um, and by relatively, you know, I mean <laughs> another uh, asterisk here. We're gonna yeah, have to another learn. asterisk. <laughs> All right, lots of asterisks. Exactly. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, we're looking at we're, we're looking at all the same things uh, as you know any any product team typically does when they're considering what what should we build, what should we you know offer to customers. So we're looking at the reach, right? How many customers and potential customers can we reach by offering this new capability? Uh, we're looking at the impact. So on the customers that we do reach. Um, what is the actual impact that we can have on their experience by offering this optimization? Um, we're looking at, you know, the the effort associated with building it, right? Have we have we built something similar to this? If so, can we leverage, you know, what we what we built in the past, um, you know, to help us get closer to a, a value addition uh, on on this service, right? So one kind of like clear example there is we started out optimizing Azure SQL DTU databases. So the DTU pricing model, um, you know, that's the database transaction unit uh, pricing model. We we optimized those and and relatively soon after, you know, we were considering a few options and we decided, hey, like let's let's go and optimize Azure vCore databases, right? These are still Azure SQL instances, um, but you know, a, a different pricing model, but we could leverage a lot of the work that we did to support DTU databases to support vCore ones, right? So um, super low effort uh, associated. But then we're also looking at, um, you know, at, at, at other factors too. I mean, you know, I, I kind of enumerated some of the high level ways that we evaluate whether we want to add support for a service versus um, you know, versus going to, I don't know, let's say a, a different service. Um, but, you know, we look at what, what customers in our install base are running, how much they're spending on each one of these services, um, and if there's an optimization opportunity on a service, right? I mean, for, um, you know, and this is evolving over time, but for certain services, there are just very few ways that they can be optimized outside of the cloud provider, right? Um, it's just a pure pay-as-you-go service. There are no instance types. You just get the resources you need when you need them, um, and you don't pay for them when you're not using them. So, you know, those are just, there's no optimization opportunity there. So, you know, we have to look at what, what value Turbo can really bring. And so that's, you know, that's another piece. Um, you know, finally, we're looking at industry research, right? Where are the where's the growth happening in terms of the services that users are, you know, that customers are actually leveraging to support their applications? Um, and we, you know, and we try to kind of balance all of these factors that we're looking at. We, um, 
uh, aside from just our install base, we're, we're getting feedback from prospects. You know, they tell us what they're using, what they're really looking for. Um, and, you know, and of course, we're always soliciting input from customer facing engineers, sales engineers, account managers, et cetera. Um, and just trying to kind of paint the fullest picture that we can and, um, you know, trying to find the services with the best kind of uh, cost benefit ratio, uh, I guess, to, uh, to, you know, to choose what to optimize next. Can you do me a favor, Joe? Can, can you kind of walk us through what it looks like to build a new service or a new optimization entity type in, in Turbo? Like just just the general skeleton of, of how that happens. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, and and actually our team has done this a lot in the last few years, right? Um, I think that especially in the public cloud area, our team is kind of, you know, our mandate is to broaden the level of support that Turbonomic can offer. So, um, you know, we're kind of the ones that are adding new service support pretty regularly. And so when we think about what it, what it comes down to in terms of adding support for a new service, um, generally we start by discovering the entities, right? And when we discover those, we start out with a, a pretty high level representation of how we think these things should be surfaced in the Turbo UI. So, you know, maybe it, it would help if I kind of gave a concrete example, right? So. Um, so if we're talking about an Azure SQL database, you know, okay, we already have, uh, so, you know, I mentioned when we were, when we were building vCore support, right? Uh, we had already built DTU database support. We had the database entity type in the Turbonomics supply chain. So, you know, the entity representation was fairly straightforward, right? We needed a, a database. Um, now, just to give you, uh, the flip side of that when we were building support for app service plans, um, that was that was much less straightforward, right? This thing, uh, like I said, it's a basket of resources. It It's kind of underlying structure is a group of VMs. Um, and we didn't wanna create a VM group because there's you know an app service plan in your Azure portal. You can scope to that thing and look at its performance characteristics. So we needed to invent a new uh, entity type to represent those. But um, but in the case of you know in of vCore databases, we chose an entity type. We discovered those entities themselves. So that's kind of step number one. Uh, step number two, we start discovering the um, pricing and cost information. So the actual meters offered by the cloud service provider that correspond to the entities in the service. Uh, we we discover those using our kind of cost probes. Um, or now we use an Azure pricing probe. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then you know, beyond that, we're discovering okay. performance metrics, stitching those to the entities, stitching the entity representation to the cost and, or pricing representations. We're parsing billing data and bringing that into the topology processor um, to kind of, you know, unify the representation. And, uh, and at, at that point, you can you know, look in the Turbonomic UI, see an entity stitched into the supply chain and contextualized in the context of uh, the rest of your cloud environment. And, um, and with, with rem representative bottom-up costs, so um, how we would calculate the hourly on-demand rate of this thing, and then um, top-down costs, so what you've actually been billed for it over time. And uh, and from there, you know, we we uh, we had analytic support to to actually implement the scaling decisions that that Turbonomic makes, and finally, we uh, kind of culminate the whole process in user experience improvements. And um, and we think about actual customer use cases. Uh, you know, we we get these fed to us by customers by you know, engineers, technical account managers in the field. And we think about how we can accomplish specific customer use cases in a way that generalizes to the rest of, uh, of you know, the kind of customer experience. Uh, we try to kind of balance building abstract representations that allow for, you know, a multitude of customers to get value from, from the solution and also uh, you know, catering to specific use cases, like we said, that we know are important to 
a select number of customers that we've that we've interacted with in early access programs, for instance. So, yeah, yeah I mean, that's a high level description of how it's done. Well, cool. thank you. Appreciate that treatment. Yeah, of course. So, so it's easy. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Nothing to it. An afternoon, two afternoons at most, no problem. Uh, yeah, you know, just. Yeah. Shooting the breeze with your buddies. Like, easy, easy, easy. easy. Yeah. <laughs> we can yeah, do it, a podcast. We can get it right done. Well, yeah. it, it's, it, it's interesting, too, because like you said, like with the app service plans, like we had to create a, you had to, we, I say we, like I did something. I did nothing. But you guys create, you guys had to create a, a whole new entity type within our supply chain, within our market. And like that, I'm sure that's, that's a whole lot of, a whole lot of complexity to, to account for. Um and then obviously by the end of it, the goal is right, all that whole process that you you kind of outlined, the the ultimate goal of that is is to help customers assure performance there and assure, you know, cost as well, you know, to, to save the money. And so, you know, kind of what you outlined is a process that a customer is gonna have to figure out one way or another if they're not using turbo, how how to kind of do that. And we've done that work for them, obviously, and uh present them with this very sort of User friendly way to see it, understand it, and and take advantage of of all that uh, all those opportunities. So it's pretty pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I mean, just back to some of the challenges that that face kind of platform as a service administrators or cloud administrators when they're dealing with these things. There are so many different management options, um, and the management options are are you know are different based on the service that you're talking about, right? So. I mentioned Azure Synapse Analytics and these dedicated SQL pools that we that we manage. Uh, they actually give you the ability to pause these things, right? You can keep the instance provisioned, keep all of the underlying data intact, and actually stop the compute resource when you're not using it. Um, and when it's stopped, you're not charged anything for that. Um, but if you think about an Azure SQL database, you can't pause that thing or stop it when it's not being used. It's just either running or you or it's deleted right and so um i think that that's another challenge when we think about challenges of of using paths and managing it um you know management strategy has to be based on the service on you know it's it's service specific so um i think that you know if if you're a cloud administrator keeping all of these management options in your mind, uh, you know, and mapping them from service to service and knowing the trade-offs and, you know, like I said, the costs of keeping things running uh, versus scaling them up, scaling them down, how to do that strategically, how uh, the cost of any entity scales when resources are provisioned up and down. Um, yeah. it, it really is in the words of, um, in the words of the founding members of Turbonomic, it's a problem that's beyond human scale. And which kind of puts it perfectly and squarely in Turbonomics wheelhouse. And that's why, you know, we believe that uh, software is the only way to manage this complexity. You know, what's crazy is you go through all this work, you put this great feature together, we're saving millions of dollars. But how do we tell people that they saved? How do we tell people that they, they, they didn't have a performance problem? Where, where do those impacts land? Like, you know, how is that visibility to the cost, to the total impact, or even at the, you know, like the business unit level or down at the application owner or resource group level, how are we exposing those costs? What's, what's the way forward? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, and, you know, for users of the Turbonomic platform, um, especially in, you know, the last, you know, I, I guess over the past six months to a year now, we've been surfacing those those numbers in the cumulative savings widget in Turbonomics. So uh, we we actually show your, you know, the, the savings that you've realized as measured by the actions that you've executed over time. So we're not only showing point in time savings, uh, we're not showing potential savings, we're showing actual savings that you've realized by executing actions in the Turbonomic UI. Now, you know, of course, there are, there are plenty of pitfalls associated with with uh, the strategy of showing those savings through executed actions, there's kind of the, you know, um, the problem of of orchestration, right? So when you go to, for instance, uh, using a Turbonomic orchestration solution like an integration with ServiceNow, um, you take, you know, 
you take uh, recommended actions and you pipe them into ServiceNow and get you know create them as tickets that are distributed to your IT team. Um, and maybe the IT team picks them up that very day and goes in and reconfigures the resources according to the recommendations. Uh, you know, there's no straightforward way for uh, for us to show that impact. But um, you know, but it's uh, it's a problem that we're working on now, and hopefully, something that will uh, will have a solution for in the near future. Great. Well, I have you tell us all about it. As a, okay. as a sales engineer, that that is the the hardest thing to see. You know, is when they're like, "Oh yeah, we took we we took all those actions." Like, it's not where. I can't. I need to build a deck, guys. I need these screenshots. Please help me. Come on. Yeah. Turbo. Yeah. And, <laughs> and that is like when when we're um, you know when we're in early access on a lot of the new optimization capabilities that we provide. You know, it's like we we work very closely with with a few of these customers, and we get to the point where okay, you know, we're we're showing you the actions. You're telling us that. These look great. They make sense. You've proven to yourself that they make sense. You've, you know, gone into your cloud portal and verified that everything we told you is true. Um, and the next thing you're going to do is download a CSV export and email it to everyone. And, yeah, right. uh, <laughs> yes. and, and maybe we'll take it during our, our next, uh, you know, change yeah. control window in a month from now or something like that. And, you know, by that time, maybe the recommendation is not even the right one. So. Um, you know, I think that speaks to the importance of automation, right? And, right. you know, once you prove to yourself that Turbonomic is trustworthy, automate it, man. Like, there's no there's no reason to, uh, to put the onus on yourself to go into your portal and click away. Um, you know, put it on autopilot. Th that's, why, that's why I think we call it the journey, right? <clears throat> because it doesn't matter how good your software is. It's we're always go, we're always sort of up against human nature and, and humans are creatures of habit. Um, and the way they've done things for so long is the way they've done things for so long. And, and you know, like you said, everything can be perfect. Everyone can say, oh, my gosh, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. But then there's still that thing like I still have to default, though, to how I've always done this. Thank you for all this great information. Yeah. <laughs> so so that, that's really the challenge. Right. And I mean, I guess all we can do is continue to talk about it, number one, but then, you know, folks like you and your team, Joe, continue putting out sort of these great features that add all this value. And then folks like Greg have to, uh, have to take them along that journey and, and get them and get them, uh, you know, changing the way they think about doing business. Because ultimately, again, if, if you can't change that, then all these tools, all these great features are, you know, what, what do we do with them? So, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we um, we host these sessions internally that are focused on uh, you know users of Turbonomic inside IBM using Turbonomic to optimize their own infrastructure and and you know and systems. And you know someone asked the other day, how do you uh, you know how do you get to the point of automation? You know how do you work with a customer? to get to the point where they are ready to entirely trust the system That's and the word. put it on autopilot. Yeah, and it's like the million dollar question, right? But um, but some of the things that we talked about are showing our work, right? Through, uh, through interfaces like the Prove It UI in each uh, action detail view. So Transparency is, is entirely important in gaining trust. Exactly, and, and that's the funniest part, right, is that uh, all of this effort that we put in to show our work and to prove that our recommendation is valid um, is just the on ramp, right? We're just right. we're just building trust, and you know, once we've actually built trust, then you know, the UI goes out the window. You don't right. all that work is anymore. Yeah, no, it's not for nothing, but man, it's gone. Like nobody's using that anymore. At this account. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, during this session, when we were talking about it, I think uh, Eva and I were, you know, talking a little bit about some strategies for building trust. And, uh, and we referenced the, you know, the tricky journey and, um, you know, taking customers on, on the, on the journey and, um, and maturing their level of, I guess I'll say uh, digital transformation and, um, 
And, you know, the next session, we, we asked Richard to speak and talk about the tricky journey. You know, what is it? How do we get customers from, you know, working in these archaic workflows to, uh, to the nirvana, which is, you know, just not having to worry about it anymore and trusting that, you know, automation will, will make the right decisions on your behalf. Yeah, you know, one of the themes that we've, we've touched on quite a bit, uh, just in this show alone, is that humans are expecting other humans to make mistakes. So when they make those mistakes, eh, it happens, you know? Yeah. We'll, we'll, trust, we'll trust old regular Joe over Dr. Joe. It's okay. Yeah, uh, yeah right. See, he knows. <laughs> uh, but when a machine makes a mistake, it's like, well, well, stop. Rip it out. All automation <laughs> must yeah. fix this so it's back to 100% test it a million hours and then put it back into service. Yeah, if a self-driving car crashes one time, it's, you know, it's headlines all over the world. But, yes. Um, but how many humans crash their cars every day, right? So um, at some level, you know, I guess we're just, like you said, more comfortable with the idea of humans making mistakes than automation. Yes, yep. Yeah, but ultimately though too, and I, can, I think this is maybe like, obviously like as part of the journey where we try to change hearts and minds there is, is you know th there is there is still a human in that automation equation, right? Yeah. It's not like you deploy turbo and and it's a black box in which you can't you know make any changes or or set guardrails or any of that stuff, right? It's it's really just a tool by which you can define what good is for a certain subset of whatever piece of the environment you're looking at. Define those guardrails, and then once you've set it up. Right. I mean, Ron Popeil sold how many million rotisseries, you know, you yes. put the chicken in and then you set it to the temperature and the time and then you let it do its thing. And the same in turbo. Right. S scope the environment, set the guardrails, define the parameters. And then from there, get away from being the, the guy that has to click the button for every action. I mean, that's that's really what we're doing here. We're, we're not making decisions for you. You're still making the decision. We're just helping you scale that. Right? We're, we're just the, the tool by which you can hit, click that button a million times. You know, yeah. it's, and it's easy enough, it, it's easy enough to, to look at the UI of Turbonomic and say, okay, what are my top five actions that I can take to affect my costs? And you're done, right? Boom, just save myself a million dollars a year on five actions. Who, who spun those up? Um, but you've got a thousand actions waiting in the wings with just a couple of dollars a month adding up, you know, like maybe some storage actions to, to scale down off of like, uh, you know, SSD or HDD. Um, and, and to go through those thousand actions for a person, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't, it takes too much time. There's too much effort involved, uh, you know, even just clicking and waiting. Right. Um, and that's, that's where you're going to unlock all of that extra that you don't even know is happening. That is adding up behind the scenes by automating it. And there's no uh -huh. other way to get that done. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, you know, even when you talk about personal financial management, right, it comes down to, uh, you know, a, a thousand tiny choices add up to a huge amount, right? I mean, buying your coffee at Starbucks every day, you're going to spend thousands of dollars over the course of the year. Maybe it's, yeah, it's just five bucks a day, but five bucks a day times 365 days a year, you know, that it adds up. Yeah. So, you know, even if, like you said, right? Humans can review the top 10, you know, highest cost impact actions, and that's easy. But when it comes to those, you know, 10,000 actions that save an average of whatever, $4.50, well, you know, execute every single one of them and look at how your savings accumulate, right? And this isn't just a flat one-time savings, this is savings over time. Never mind, it's not a flat time, one time savings. It's not a flat one time. This thing's never going to change again, right? So a thousand actions to get you some cost impacts where you want to be. But what happens when those things get get utilized more? Well, oh, I saved some money, but it fell over, right? Well, what good does that do you? So you have to, it's not, there's no such thing as one time optimization. It, it's continuous. It has to be continuous. It's a practice. Optimization yeah. is a practice, just like, just like working out, you know, it's just it's the same thing. Seriously. I wouldn't know anything about that. I don't I, know more listen, about this working me, out. Me neither. Joe was saying he goes outside, and I was about to say, I don't know what that's like. Yeah. Anymore. I just, he goes outside. Know. yeah, I don't know about it's a magical place. I've heard I've, I've never been. Um, it's real. <laughs> it's real. It's, it's crazy. Trust yeah. me, right? 
Uh, uh, so, so, I mean, again, and we, we've kind of talked, I think, um, in a roundabout way about a lot of the different sort of services that, that we, that we help to optimize, but maybe, and I don't know, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but is there, is there like a, a list of, of things that we're doing today in turbo for maybe those who, you know, yeah. haven't seen turbo or, or, or maybe curious about sort of like what specifically we, we, you don't have to go into detail about all of them, but. Yeah, just, no, I can, I can just touch on a few. So, um, so when we talk about platform as a service optimization, uh, you know, we offer, we offer, op I'll just say various forms of optimization on, uh, like I said, Azure SQL databases. These are the DTU and vCore purchase models of Azure SQL. Uh, AWS RDS, so the relational database service, we do compute and storage optimization. Um, then uh, Azure App Service, I talked about that as well. Uh, Azure Synapse Analytics, and um, soon, soon to be released, coming soon, Azure Cosmos DB optimization. So that's the NoSQL database in Azure that, that we talked about. And there are hey, there it is. I was hoping the pom poms would come out. <laughs> I knew they were going to come out. Plenty, plenty of exciting things coming. Fanfare. Um, and <laughs> and actually, there are other projects in development that I won't call out by name now because we're not quite ready to unveil those. But I figured it's. Uh, it's Can you give us a hint. Use <laughs> words that rhyme with it. You know what I mean? You don't have to say no. It's fine. It's fine. We don't get you in trouble. No, you know, um, <laughs> all I all I can say is that you know our goal in in the PaaS optimization team, and and I guess now you know I'll say in the broader cloud integrations team, is to release one generally available PaaS optimization every quarter from here on out. That's aggressive. Uh, so so you know our goal is to basically always be in development on two. So. Um, so every by the end of each quarter, we have one that's going early access and another that's going GA. Then the one that was early access at the end of, let's say, Q1 goes GA at the end of Q2. Um, when one goes GA, we start another, right? So uh, so that's the cadence that we're trying to move at. And it's it's pretty aggressive. You know, I mean, yeah. it, took us, it took us a long time to get here. But I think uh, at this point, we've kind of gotten the... Uh, you know, we've gotten it down to a science. It's kind of a well-oiled machine now. So that's what I was going to uh, say. You guys have probably made, made a pretty good practice out of this. Um, uh, how many teams of people are you working on you know, with each of those things? Is it one team working on the the, the preview, and the one is working on getting it generally available? Like two teams? Like how does that work? Yeah. So, um, so I have to give a just a huge shout out to my engineering team. Oh yeah, do it. You know, the PaaS optimization team is full of rock stars. We are we. Up until this point, right? Like I, I mentioned that you know we're expanding now into what we're calling the cloud integrations team, which is a much larger group. It's it's actually a set of three teams, but um, but the PaaS optimization team up until this point is a team including myself of eight. So this is you know six development engineers, one uh, quality engineer, and myself, and. Um, We've we've been working on an average of probably three different work streams uh, for all of the year of 2023, and so it's one team of people that's been doing this. Uh, that's cool. And and you know and I would be uh, it would be misleading if I if I said that we didn't have uh, tons of help and support from you know other folks in R and D yeah. architects uh, you know support from other teams. Etc. But in terms of actually developing the productized PaaS optimization, uh, it's it's a single development team doing that. And you know, like I said, our our team is in the midst of expanding right now. So soon it'll be three teams kind of coming together to work on uh, the integration of Turbonomic and Aptio, combined yeah. with uh, broadening the scope of of PaaS optimization opportunities that exist in Turbo. You hear that, Joe? I mean, regular Joe. You're pretty impressive. You're gonna have some openings pretty soon. That could be your next. Ah, listen, I'm just I'm saying. So I'll send my red. That's fine. We'll talk after. We'll talk after. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I I just thought of uh, that scene from uh, Glenn Gary Glenn Ross when you were talking about like how you guys have this super like, aggressive release cycle working on so much. It's a small team, and it's like uh, you know, coffee is for coders. I guess that's that should be the 
<laughs> ABC always be coding. You know what I mean? Uh, so yeah, we've, that, we've, that's pretty amazing. We've gotten it. We really do have an incredible team. And, um, you know, I, I think that the PaaS optimization group has, has not only as a functional unit developed uh, over, over time, but, you know, we had a group of, I think it was 12 people about two and a half years ago. And through a series of events, that team went down to just, uh, to just one other engineer and myself. And we rebuilt the team from scratch uh, back up to eight right now. And, you know, most of these, you know, the majority of the team